Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And it's just going to be the three of us today. Uh, Joe had jury duty and I wasn't sure he was going to be locked away in a hotel for some murder trial or something, so I didn't book a guest for us. Uh, but we're going to kind of answer, somebody asked on Twitter, what tools and software we as professional authors use. So we're going to discuss that in the beginning, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how to get more fan engagement on Twitter and Facebook. Because I see a lot of people not using these platforms to their fullest, and Facebook especially can be pretty powerful. It's, you know, for almost any audience, maybe not the teen so much, but uh, for most of us, our people are there. So it's, it's good to be able to reach out with them and uh, engage with them. And uh, I actually sell a lot of books when I have a new release and uh, share the post on, Twitter, on Facebook. That's kind of like the one other place besides my mailing list that I can count on. And it's less effort than doing a blog post. So <laughs> um, before we jump into that stuff, do you guys have any news? Uh, let's see. Well, I can say that uh, for me, I've, I'd like to say things are finally calming down with the addition of a new little fur baby. But as you can probably hear in the background, she found her squeaker's toy. So there she goes. But uh, so I'm getting back into writing full time dogs. And uh, I'm getting I'm wrapping up my latest mystery going to be working on my latest fantasy as well. And I'm also thinking about taking a short story that I wrote in dark fantasy and stretching it out to a full book. Because I've had a lot of people ask about that one. Um, oh, and I found, I found out I will be moving again in a couple of months, going just to another spot here in Phoenix. It's going to be a much nicer, much bigger apartment there. So, and we're hiring people to do it. So hopefully it'll be as less stress as possible. <laughs> That's about it for me. Uh, as for me, I do indeed have jury duty right now, and I, I, I've discovered that I don't miss having a commute. So the, that's that's one thing. But I have uh, I have been outlining uh, what I hope to be my first rapid release. Uh, the second book is outlined more or less. I mean, I have the notes. I haven't actually formed the outline. Uh, and I have, and the urban fantasy. It's going to be urban fantasy, and the series is now officially going to be called Shards of Shadow, and the first book is going to be called The Traitor in the Shadows. So. Good series name. Thank you. It's moving. It's moving toward completion, or at least it's moving toward the next stage. But that's about it. I'm a little. I'm a little burnt out because I've been up since five forty-five. Yeah, Joe's a night owl, so <laughs> we keep him up late for the show. Um, well, for my news, I wish I was in Joe's place where I already had the first book of a new series written. I uh, decided I needed to give my readers, my fans, a, a new installment in my Chains of Honor series, which has been languishing, untouched for years. So I wrote the third one, and I uh, sent that off to my editor. And I thought, well, I, I think I can wrap up the series with one more book. So I'm writing the fourth one, and I'm getting close to the end. And these are not books I can put in Kindle Unlimited because the series has always been wide. So there's no reason for me to go long with them. <laughs> but of course, they want to be long stories that, you know, I was over 100K with the last one and this one's getting up there too. Um, so it's like, I'm glad to finish up the series and I actually do enjoy it. But it, it, at the same time, it's a series that never sold real well or <laughs> did anything spectacular. And that's why it was abandoned. So I find myself a little impatient to get through it and get on to the next thing, which hopefully will be uh, something I can put into Kindle Unlimited, which I enjoy doing since it makes more money that way. <laughs> and that's the state of affairs as we go into 2019. Uh, this, you know, this will, of course, get pay for the cover art and the editing and everything. But uh, like I said, I've, I'm probably going to try to relaunch the first one uh, when the last one comes out. So we'll see if I can get something going and uh, pump up sales a little bit. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking of doing is I noticed uh, just a couple weeks ago, Chris Fox put his first four um, tech mage, I, I forget the name of his series, the Dragons in Space uh, series into a box set, which is something I've done with my series for quite a while, but he actually launched it at 99 cents as if it was a completely new release. And he went out and tried to get all the, the mailing list plugs and everything. And I haven't taken a peek to see how it's doing, but um, usually when I put together a box set, I just throw it out there for like $7.99 or $9.99 and wait until I can get a book bub for it. But I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of I have a two series right now that are still in KU 
and uh, it might be interesting to uh, do a box set and, and try to launch it as if it was a new book one and see if you could get the momentum going. I do think it would be a challenge since everybody on my list has probably already read the books. Um, I should add for news, I've seen on a couple of Facebook groups that people are getting dinged or actually seriously threatening letters from Amazon for bonus content now in the back of books that are in Kindle Unlimited. So even if you just get, like it should be okay if it's less than 10% is their rule, but they've been sending nasty grams to people even uh, with less than 10%, you know, with just like, here's my after word and stuff like that. So just something to be aware of. Um, I haven't heard anything yet for myself, but it could just be a matter of time. Um, I don't think I have too much of that kind of thing. I, if, at the most, I might have a chapter one at the end of a book one uh, for the next book in the series. Um, but yeah, so that's it for my news and what I've heard lately around the grapevine. Shall we? Nasty emails from Amazon. I haven't gotten one of those yet. Knock on wood. You don't have anything left in Kindle Unlimited, right? <laughs> I do not. No, I do not. <laughs> This is, I mean, it's good that they're addressing it because we were all complaining about this last year, like whole bonus books that people were getting credit for at the back of their novels. But uh, as seems to be typical, they may be swinging the hammer a little too hard and far if they're uh, now going after folks with just a few pages of extra content. So just something to be wary of if you've got a whole extra novella or something in the back of your KU books, you might want to take that out before they come looking for you. All right. Let is, let's move on to talking a little bit about uh, what tools or software or sites we use as professional authors to uh, make life easier, I guess, or help us gain an edge. I, I don't know if any of my stuff I can put into that category, but um, do you guys want to go first and talk about what you use just for writing? Uh, for me, very simple. I use uh, Microsoft's Word or Word 2013 if you want to get technical been using it for years and I know it inside and out so I don't see myself changing anytime soon unless I switch to a Mac which I am considering. <laughs> I was gonna say you don't have a Mac do you? I'm I'm going over edits in Word right now and it keeps crashing and I'm just like <laughs> stab with the dagger. <laughs> uh, as for me I use Scrivener for writing. I also I use a lot of stuff for writing like uh, I use Scrivener, I use Word sometimes uh, when it's like just a short story and I don't feel like setting up a whole file. And when I'm on the road or otherwise need to collaborate, I use Google Docs and then end up dumping that as a docx and using it in Word. So those are my three ways I tend to get most of my writing. Also, by the way, legal notebooks. <laughs> I, I do a lot of writing in those when I'm uh, in the outline phase. I should say that too. I've got notebooks up the wazoo. Whenever I know I'm going somewhere, just in case I'm bored by myself, grab a notebook, start jotting down some notes for another story. Do it all the time. I used to be more of a notebook person. I used to just write the whole first draft basically in notebooks and then scribble it over. But I realized eventually that wasn't super efficient for me. It's just easier if I can start the outline right away in a Scrivener. I do occasionally take notes on my phone. Um, but there's some spoilers for my preferred <laughs> writing program is Scrivener. I think I wrote my first, well, I wrote my first novel in Lotus <laughs> in the 90s, but uh, moved to Word. And uh, I remember having, I don't know what it's like now. It probably has more features and stuff, but you had to like make your own table of contents if you wanted to be able to jump, like if you wanted all your chapters or scenes and being able to easily access them without scrolling through 300 pages. Um, and I, I think it's still this case because when I use it as a editing tool, going back and forth with my editor at, at that point, I'm in Word. Every time it opens up, it opens at the top of the file instead of where you left off. And uh, if you're like, we're working on some scene in the middle or something, you know, I got all this scrolling and everything. So I became a Scrivener convert pretty much the first time I opened it and I saw that you could have all your scenes over on the left hand panel and all your characters and uh, there's a research section where I put my story Bible and, and any notes to myself and I will just um, if I'm doing a series I just copy all that stuff from the last file into like you know book two book three book four so I kind of have this building thing and uh, it's for me it's been a huge time saver not having to just look back through stuff and or keep a separate notebook or file for that kind of thing I know it has other features but that's the main thing that I like is just having that all easily accessible Lotus. That's a blast from the past. I haven't heard that one in a good long while. <laughs> I had Lotus and then I had to convert them. I think they, cause they program went away or something. <laughs> 
Yeah, it was quietly discontinued. I remember hearing about that. And there's a lot of people that used it. I, I remember, I've used it a few times back in the day, but you know, obviously not for a very long time. I don't know if it predates Word or it's just what was on my computer at, in the 90s. I'm pretty sure it predates Word. It could very well be because um, I had a PC, you know, it was all Windows. I actually have written, stuff written in DOS <laughs> from way back in the day, but we won't talk about that. Five and a quarter floppies? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I don't think I was that old. I think we had the three and a half inch. <laughs> All right. Um, so, what do you guys use for uh, formatting your uh, ebook files? I've been doing my formatting for years. I, I I still use the same thing, Word. I know the thing inside and out. I know how to get the the correct table of contents in there. Everything you need, inserting a picture, whatnot. So, I'm, I've I've used Calibre before, and I, I know it has a, good, a lot of good potential. But I'm just more familiar with Word. So, but like I said, I'm going to be switching eventually to Mac. So I'm sure that those programs will be changing soon. Uh, as for me, uh, I do. Uh, I have a really janky system. Like I, I came up through Smashwords, so I am indeed very good at getting extremely clean formats in in Word. So I still tend to do the the bulk of my formatting in Word, and then when the time comes to actually make uh, ebook files, I will dump it into Calibre, uh, which I call Caliber because I'm bad at pronouncing words. And I will use that to make any tweaked versions of the books. Like, like you can edit uh, 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 EPUBs in that. So if you want to get real fancy and have it do stuff that most other ebooks don't do, you can go down to the bare HTML with that. Uh, and also spit out, you know, Moby, which is really the only other one you really need, but you can spit out virtually every ebook format ever. If somebody is still using a Sony e-reader, <laughs> I can I can give them the format for that. So yeah, uh, uh, Word into Calibre is what I do. All right, I, I've kind of over the eight years or so gone the gamut. From uh, first, I paid somebody who specialized in formatting ebooks to do it for me for about a hundred dollars uh, per. And then eventually my editor started doing it. I think she used a program called Juto. And um, I, I've heard of Calibre too. I think I had it on my computer at one point for checking files. Um, but when Vellum came out, I checked it out right away. And I, I believe it's still Mac only. But this was the first thing where you could just like drag and drop your cover and drag and drop your Word file and boom, there's an ebook. So, and it also lets you do some stuff like at the end, I always put a link to like, oh, here's the next book in the series. And um, it makes it easily so you can put in the Amazon link for the Mobi version and then the like a books to read link for an EPUB version. And if you want, you can do separate EPUB versions and links for each store. I usually just do a generic EPUB and use the books to read link uh, that redirects them to their favorite store. But and then you just press the button and it gives you both versions. So I am a huge fan of that now. And I, I regret that I, I have to go back. I have such a big backlist at this point I, that I need to go back and redo all the old books that I didn't format because it is so much easier if somebody reports a typo to KDP select. I don't know if you've got in any of these, like somebody reported an error and now it started like telling you every single morning. <laughs> Like it's the same error. It's just letting you know you have one or more books. It's flagged or something. And I'm like, well, I've fixed all the ones that were really easy to do because I formatted them myself. And I, but I have some others I have to still go back. And I'm like, well, I'll just sit down one day when I have a couple hours and redo the whole series. Um, but so Vellum is my choice for formatting eBooks. And this is one of those things where. Like I said, I used to pay someone to do it and then my editor for a while, but you end up having enough typos. If you have enough readers <laughs> over the years, they will find them and either report them to you or report them to Amazon, or you just want to be able to update the back matter. Like when you have the next book in the series ready, or if you've changed your mailing list perk, and it's just a pain in the butt if you have a big lap backlist and you have to email somebody else and ask them to spend their time on updating your, this little thing. So highly recommend that. That is one thing I think it's good if you do it yourself. And like I said, with Vellum, it, it really only, I'm going to say it takes five minutes. And that's including like checking to uh, verify that everything came out okay. All right. What do you guys use for your mailing list provider? 
Well, I used to use a plugin through WordPress called Newsletter, obviously enough, and I have since uh, migrated everything over to MailChimp, and I'm still getting the familiar with how everything works, but thus far I'm liking it a lot better. I uh, also use MailChimp. Uh, I use MailChimp f like w <laughs> initially. I had a uh, I had a Google uh, uh, like survey that would take people's stuff, and that's just fraught with mishap because that's how you get your your home address flagged as spam. But that was very 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 early on when I had like a hundred subscribers, uh, and then I moved it all over to MailChimp. And up until literally uh, a month ago. Mailchimp did absolutely everything I wanted, but when I after we had uh, the guest on talking about how to like prune your mailing list to get rid of the dead weight, I found that uh, there is one and only one feature that I would have to pay two hundred dollars a month extra to get that I finally needed. Needed? I didn't. I don't really need it. But so so Mailchimp has been ninety nine percent perfect for me, and that one percent was very recent. What was the feature you were trying to do? <laughs> uh, I was trying to get a very finely sliced up uh, uh, segment of people who like haven't opened the last 10 emails and, you know, haven't clicked on any of this and any of that and blah, blah, blah. And it got like, you can add, it ended up being, uh, I couldn't get it sliced up finely enough. Uh, I got to the point where that would be advanced segmentation, which is one of the pro tools. I forget exactly what thing that I bumped up against, but it was, it was frustrating because I'm, I used to be in it and I know that this is just a, a, a SQL command that like they're making, they're charging me $200 a month. They would charge me $200 a month to add an extra and to a SQL command. <laughs> and I was like, God, ah, curse you. You shall not get my money. But other than that, Top notch. It's super easy to put emails together and uh, pretty darn good at keeping track. I mean, the analytics aren't super reliable, but that's the case on every provider that I'm aware of. Yeah, I've, I've heard good things about MailChimp. That seems to be the recommended one for a lot of uh, authors that are more professional <laughs> with the mailing list stuff and teach courses and things. Um, I'm not on it. I'm on AWeber, and I've mentioned before mostly because I'm have grandfathered in at this point to a pretty cheap rate and um, I would have to pay more too for more advanced stuff. I just haven't cared enough to, <laughs> to do that and pay more at this point, especially since I pay like way less than even the base rate. Don't tell them that. Um, but they are, you know, I don't know if they have, I mean, I think they have all the bells and whistles if you're willing to pay for them. At, at a certain point, I, I think all these services kind of get to be pretty similar in cost. You just want to be careful Every now and then there are some that get that start out real cheap or free and then somehow end up paying more once you've got like more than 10,000 on your list or if you're sending a lot of emails. Um, yeah, that's it for me. I, I have no trouble recommending them. I mean, I've been with them since I would say like 2005, 2006, and I've never had a, you know, like problem where I had to email them. So for me, that's excellent. I'm, I've heard of a couple other places imploding <laughs> this last year or two and uh, just, wow, like some super frustration. Like you tried to mail your list about your launch and the, it all got sent to spam or it didn't even go out or something. And so I, I'm a lot, I'm a big fan of stuff that's just reliable and, and you don't have to <laughs> worry about it. All right. Any more thoughts on mailing list stuff, guys? Do you use anything else related to that? Any plugins for your website or anything? Like I said, for me, it was just the one I was, was using primarily, and I got tired of it because they kept making changes, and all the ease of use went right out the window. So, you know what? Everyone that says MailChimp is great, so I went over to it, you know, imported all my, my uh, contacts into it, and been working great ever since. Um, the only other thing, and I haven't, I haven't uh, messed with it too much, but, uh, I mean, obviously, MailChimp will allow you to create an embed, you know, your own sign-up page, and you can, it'll give you embed code to put on your site for signing up. I have not tinkered yet with uh, you, putting something on my site that does a sign up pop up. I don't like pop ups, but uh, if I do a site overhaul, I might experiment with that. And if I do, I'll let everybody know, but that's in the future. Yeah, I'm not a fan of pop ups either. Nobody is, of course. I've certainly heard that they work extremely well, um, but I feel like as authors, we are kind of creating a relationship with our readers a little more than just selling a product. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this in the social media branding kind of stuff, but uh, 
the last thing I would want to do is annoy a reader. Whereas like if I was just selling widgets and they're probably never going to come back to my site to buy another widget, I, I'm just, I could see like, yep, pop up, sign up, sign up, sign up. <laughs> so, and, and that's just my personal take. I've certainly seen authors with pop-ups mailing list things. And I think if you can do the kind where it's not going to keep happening, <laughs> if the person comes back to your site later the same day or the next day, uh, and I also, I don't know, this is just my hunch, but I feel like if you do the kind of pop-up where it at least waits till you start reading something and, you know, the ones that instantly pop up when I feel like I would just hit back as a, as a surfer, uh, not that we should rely on our own personal taste as far as marketing goes, you are very welcome to test uh, the pop-up and, and test how long it should wait till it pops up. Um, but yeah, just, I always t like to keep the reader in mind and even though we are entrepreneurs and running a business, I, I tend to think of them, I think a little differently than uh, the casual person selling uh, sponges or something online. <laughs> All right, uh, do you guys use anything for monitoring sales reporting? Because as we all know, it's like ridiculously hard. I mean, I know Kobo's pretty good. Um, Amazon's improved, but I remember at one point an agent wanted to know how many copies of my Emperor's Edge series I sold, and I was like, uh, uh, you know, because you had to just get every month's Excel sheet and tally up for each book. So um, now, fortunately, there are some tools out there. What do you guys use? I just use the basic built in stuff that from KDP as well as the one from Smashwords is what I have right now. I have used a uh, uh, tracker box, which uh, I don't know if they made the Mac version for a while. They were, they were kickstarting a Mac version a little while ago, uh, but it's, uh, you still have to download all the individual files, but it, it, it dumps them all into a, a, a file and makes it pretty easy. Again, it's just SQL scripts, uh, uh, which that's the other thing. I was in IT forever, so I have a profound number of Python scripts that I've written myself specifically for figuring out certain things about my books. Like, uh, it's very hard to get the actual earnings if you make money in more than one country. So I have a thing that will go through and find out what the exchange rate was at the time. And it's, these are the nerd things I do. So tracker box, and some custom stuff and some Excel sheets are what I do for, for tracking book sales. All right. And I just, it actually wasn't until about a year ago, maybe two years ago, I started using Book Report, which is, I think it's around $140 a year right now. Uh, you know, I, I use it so infrequently that it's kind of up in the air whether it's worth it, but I want to, it auto renewed <laughs> as those things do if you're not paying attention. So I was like, all right, okay. But it's, it's definitely nice. It, um, Right now, I believe they're just Amazon, but that's, for me, that's about 90% of my income sales. So uh, one of the th things was you could go in there and just like see how much you've earned all time uh, or see how, you know, see how much you've done this for this year. And then you could get real specific. How much did this book earn over the two weeks of its launch? So it's pretty nice for that. And they also have a, um, you can put in what you want them to use for estimating like your, this month's sales for KU. Like you can put in, ah, I, I think KU might be like 0.4 cents uh, per page read this month or, you know, or it'll just default to, I think, 0.5. So it's kind of nice to see where you are for this month. Um, and then it will do all your pen names and stuff too if you're doing all that. So I, I think it's a pretty decent feature if, if you care. I'm, I'm not obsessive about that stuff. I kind of like look at like, how, how much did I make this month? All right, good. I made <laughs> more than I spent and can pay all the bills. So I'm good. Um, but I know a lot of other people are, are much more excited about it. <laughs> and it's, I find it exciting when you're doing well because you have a new series out or something. But I, I tend to not look for months at a time after that. All right. Um, do you guys buy any stock images or anything like that? I've got an account at uh, Shutterstock where if I need to come up with something generic like a scroll or a, some sort of little decorative board or whatnot, I'll usually go there. Uh, otherwise, uh, any of my uh, illustrations like covers and whatnot, those are all custom made. I have um, a profound amount of custom uh, uh, commissions uh, and fan art too, but obviously I don't tend to use fan art uh, for like official things because I didn't pay for it. So I certainly don't want to, to use it without permission 
occasionally I'll get permission. If it's particularly good, I'll seek out the person and see. But when I need artwork uh, for anything like that, I have hundreds upon hundreds of images uh, that are actually book specific on my hard drive. All right. Well, I have not commissioned nearly that much art. And I feel like I actually enjoy going to these sites. I have an iStock photo account. Um, they're pretty expensive. I recently just found some of same, the same pictures on art or 123rf.com. And we, we can put these links in the show notes. Uh, you know, stock images of dragons, cartoon dragons, castles, knights, things like that. And I will use these on uh, Facebook mostly. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit coming up. But it's, as Facebook will remind you now, if you try to put up just a text update, like, oh, you'll get more engagement if you have pictures. And there's only so many times you can use your own cover art, especially if you're not specifically talking about the book. So I, I found a quite a fun selection of little humorous, cartoony dragons and castles and, and nights like that. So, and I've used those for ads and also just for throwing them up on a post that they're loosely related to, um, like I said, to kind of help with engagement. So for me, that's iStockPhoto.com and 123RF.com. All right. Um, I also, of course, use Facebook mostly just to look at the news, Facebook groups and um, keyboards. I I'm, haven't been as big on the forum lately, but I, I kind of pop in there once in a while. I feel that news tends to break there or in these groups. So if you're curious, like the, the books bonus stuff, you know, hammer coming down, it's nice to get a heads up in advance. So that's maybe a decent reason to be subscribed to a few of the author groups out there. Do you guys uh, pay attention to the news or what's going on? I do. And pretty much the same thing, keeping on keyboards and, and, uh, and Facebook groups just to see what's going on. So ditto here. Uh, likewise, I, I, although honestly, I spend less time on keyboards and more time seeing people on Twitter linking things on keyboards. So I've sort of crowdsourced the, the, uh, the aggregation of news <laughs> through, through Twitter, but, uh, yeah, it all tends to cycle back to the same couple places. There you go. That's probably me. I'm one of those people because if I can't find a blog post or something to share, I'm like, oh, anything going on keyboards? Okay, yeah, I'll tweet that today. <laughs> All right. Uh, one other thing I like that I use, uh, we had Alex Newton from Kalytics on the show last summer. And uh, after that, I went and got his sci-fi and fantasy report that was just specific to that genre. And he does a couple each year. It looks like he's updating kind of summer and winter. He just, he's got a new sci-fi and fantasy report out that I'm going to, I haven't checked out yet since I'm just in the middle of finishing this up. But I will probably take a peek before I do my sci-fi series just so you know, see like, ah, it's genetic engineering and up and coming uh, <laughs> subgenre that's not too crowded. I don't know. Let's see. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see maybe which of the categories you get that you might want to target. And uh, his reports are pretty good. He tends to uh, also mention like if there's a sci-fi category, I forget, is it men's adventure that there's also a sci-fi, like things you wouldn't necessarily think to click from your uh, two categories that you can pick from. So I've enjoyed those. I actually got a subscription uh, to his service, which is, um, I think it's good if you publish a lot or if you are publish a publisher yourself and you wanna see what's going on in a lot of different genres. Um, but I think uh, if you're just sci-fi fantasy or a very specific niche genre and you're, you know, maybe publishing a few books a year or one book a year, then just go grab the reports. I think they're about $40, but um, definitely worth it to see what's kind of trending and what may be untrending <laughs> and going down. Um, I don't know. Have you guys used those at all since we talked to him? I, I, I a little bit, but not really much to be able to say with certainty anything about it. I have gone through, well, we, you know, I got one of the reports as a result of talking to him uh, here on the podcast and I've, I've used it. I don't spend a lot of time uh, researching trends and, and stuff like that. Uh, what I, what I find myself more doing when I'm doing that kind of thing is looking for ways to uh, prepare myself for better advertising. And as a result, a little bit more useful for me than Kalytics, which is very useful. Uh, a little bit more useful for me is KDP Rocket which is uh, mostly used for finding keywords, uh, but also does a lot of ranking stuff and it lets you know that sort of thing. So KDP Rocket fills a similar need for me. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I've, I haven't used it. I've heard good things for hunting down keywords. Um, yeah, with Kalytics, it's sort of like, if you want to write to genre or write to market, I think it'd be a really good, definitely check out the reports. I tend to use it. I'm already, I'm right the story I want to write. And then I'm like, well, which categories can I put it in? And that's where it's kind of useful to see, okay, that category is very competitive right now, but all oh, over here, you know, you could call, you know, your book falls into that one too. And so maybe you should go with that one. Okay. I'm going to pass this over to you guys. Cause you had some more tools that I don't have. Um, do you want to go first there, Joe? Sure. Um, I still occasionally, because I'm doing the Patreon thing, uh, which, you know, it's a, it's a monthly release of something that doesn't need to have a 100% professional cover. Uh, for the first couple of them, I was making my own covers again, using, you know, pulling, pulling from the pile of art that I'm allowed to use for that purpose. Uh, so when I have to do artwork for any purpose, uh, covers or advertisements or the like, I use a free alternative to uh, Photoshop that's called GIMP, which is the GNU image processor. Uh, so that's a good one. Also, if you have a lot of artwork that you need to, to, to catalog, there's a program called Digicam, which is free and open source and on every platform. It's just, it's mostly, it's supposed to be for, for photography, but it's very good at, you can apply tags to all the stuff. So I need a picture of a dragon and a castle. You just type in your tags and it will bring them up. So if you have uh, a lot of your own artwork that you need to catalog, I, I recommend Digicam. Uh, if you are a, a, an IT nerd, then Python is the scripting language that I use, and SQLite is the database system that I use. <laughs> Every now and then when I need to do a lot of numbers crunching, I'll, I'll be using both of those. Uh, I keep a very old Kindle and also a Kindle Paperwhite for checking just to make sure that everything is going to behave itself because they're the sort of the least common denominator, if it will work on a Kindle, like the, the legacy Kindle device, it's going to look good on virtually anything else that Kindle made. So I keep one of those. Uh, Book Funnel, uh, we talk about it tons on the show. It almost goes without saying, but I use Book Funnel for, uh, for delivering uh, eBooks. Yeah, I, uh, I totally forgot them and I, I use them all the time, especially yeah. for the Patreon extra stuff where you're just going to have a, you know, you're not putting it for sale or not till later. Uh, I didn't put it on, on my little list here, but I realized I should also mention, you mentioned it earlier, books to read. Uh, it's, I mean, almost not even a service. It is a service, obviously. You're, you sign up and you put your stuff, but it's free and it's just for uh, uh, linking all of your books in a very efficient way. So books to read is excellent. And just on that note, because I didn't mention that, <laughs> I forgot to make that as a special note too. Um, somebody else had asked me if another site was as good or better than them. And I looked at it and it, you know, I, I won't name the site, but it charged, it was free for US links to Amazon, but then it charged for other stores and around the world stuff, um, which is fine. But Books to Read is completely free. These, it's run by draft to digital so they make their money over at draft to digital with the distribution and stuff. So hopefully, you know, it's a good tool and hopefully it will continue to be free. I can't predict the future, but since they make their money elsewhere, one can hope. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Joe. And the other thing is, uh, particularly because I, I've been working very light on, like I, I have a lot of, I have, I have a lot of computers and uh, I am distributed across all of them at various times. So Dropbox, OneDrive and Google Drive. I have all three of them uh, for data backup and also delivering large files and also making sure that all of my computers have all the same sort of environment for writing on them. So I can just, if I get a new computer, and I need to be able to, to be writing on it in 15 minutes. I can just go on, line on, drop Dropbox on it and say, give me all my stuff. So yeah, uh, I very much recommend Dropbox, but OneDrive and Google Drive are basically equivalent. And just get a, get a, a cloud backup thing or you, you will not regret it. Yeah, I didn't think to mention it either, but I also use Dropbox. I pay the 9.99 and I don't know, I've got whole audio books many audiobooks and things on there and I haven't used my storage limit. So agree as, as writers, we definitely, I've got, you know, the hard backup drive that I back up to regularly that sits next to my computer. And then I know Dropbox is good in case my house burns down or something. <laughs> I lose everything. All right. Jeff has some more stuff. Uh, out of curiosity, if you store your audiobook files on Dropbox, what is your size capacity on there? 
They give you tons. I've never even come close to using up how much they give you with the 999. I think it's just their basic account. I think they might have a free one too, but that is more limited, but it, it's been worth it for me. Yeah, good deal. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention that you know, the tools I use is, is mentioning with the cover. I know we've gone over before, but uh, every artist I've ever used, I actually literally found them on deviantart.com. Um, they I've found some fantastic deals out there. So I've met some really nice people and I've used five to six different artists out there now. So you know, if you need a, I need a cover done professionally, they're the ones to look for. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I've, I've test formatted my eBooks on my iPad pro and I've got about every app there is for it for the nook, you know, the Kobo, the, the Amazon, the Apple, so I can see how it looks. Cause one of the things I like to do is I like to test first. So I'll create the EPUB or create, create the Mobi, put it on my iPad and see how it looks. And, usually get and generates a few expletives because something didn't go right so go back and make the changes and so forth so it helps and backup i i you know, dropbox i've got uh i think i've got multiple pcs i've got my ipad and i've got flash drives so i've got make sure i've got my stuff backed up about every way which way that you can possibly do it yeah i should mention too that um i also will check even though vellum's really quite good and it's been pretty rare to have issues every now and then you got something that comes up and I, I check uh, I've got the iBooks app on my Mac and also the Kindle app so I can just make sure the EPUB and Mobi came out and I've got a uh, Kindle Previewer 3 also it's just a little more just more stuff than just the Kindle app as far as looking to make sure everything is fine so those are what I use. And I just realized one more that I forgot to mention, which I very rarely use, but Canva, C-A-N-V-A, for um, if you want to like take a stock photo and add some text or something, like if you're going to, or your cover, if you're doing ads for like BookBub, we've talked about before how the, their PC, PPC ads <laughs> um, or CPM, whatever they are, I think they have both. Uh, you you got to put together an image, right? You have to like, here's your book cover, get this now, free on you know amazon or whatever and i think that's one of the reasons we some of us don't do them use them as much because you we either don't have those talents or uh not interested in doing it i've done them i with book launches i'll usually just ask my cover artist folks to put together some ads for me but if you want to do try to do some memes on facebook or something or just try to do your own ads they make it pretty easy to upload a photo and throw some text on there uh, if you're curious, uh, the the one hundred dollar a year plan, which I believe is the lowest paid plan for for Dropbox, is one terabyte, and my entire literary career on, is on it, including most of my audiobooks, and I've used three point seven percent of it. So, <laughs> so not much. Got it. <laughs> my Dropbox is actually larger than my current hard drive because I'm running a little netbook PC. All right, pretty good spot to back stuff up. All right, we're going to move on to some social media stuff. Um, I just picked Twitter and Facebook. Those are the two I use and that I'm comfortable talking about. You know, we've had folks on that have talked about Instagram and Pinterest and some of the other stuff. Uh, so if you like search the site, you should be able to find those episodes. Um, but why don't we jump in with a uh, Facebook? Um, I, I will say first thing you want to do is you, if you actually want to get some of your people to your sites, and I'm, I haven't done this for a while. I need to actually do this with the next release. You should actually link to your sites, your social media sites in the back of maybe not every book, but like if the last book you plugged your email list, maybe the next one, you know, you, oh, by the way, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, wherever you are. And that brings in a lot of signups, assuming a decent number of people are reading your books. Do you guys do that? Do you do anything to get people to your follow you on Twitter or Facebook? Well, with my Facebook, yeah, I've, I've got a little, I've got a blurb at the end of, you know, my, my books as well saying, you know, if you, you know, enjoy the books or you need to get a hold of me, whatnot, you know, this is where you can find me. And I always put a link both to my blog as well as to where they can find me on Facebook. So I always put a little something a little on there. Like now I usually, uh, it's very rare that I'll actually turn down a friend request. So, you know, feel free to friend me. I will friend you back sort of thing. Yeah, and it works fairly well. I, uh, my current back matter with the exception of one book, uh, I should say the current back matter, which I will be changing shortly, uh, has a little list of all of the places you can find me online. Just, just sort of a contact chunk. Uh, likewise, there is a ribbon at the bottom of every one of my emails. It's got little icons for my social media presences. Uh, and that's 
probably how I got most of my, my followers. Uh, I, at this point, what I'm probably going to do is collapse all of that stuff in the back matter into a, here's my contact page on my, on my website, which also has a newsletter sign up. So uh, basically it's, instead of having a row of links, I'm going to have one link that also sneakily gives you the opportunity to sign up separate from a separate request request to sign up and, and it will remain on my website and at the bottom of every one of my newsletters. Right. I tend to assume that people are only going to do like a max of one action if you have a link at the back. So I kind of pick like, well, this time I'm going to ask for, you know, if you like this, please leave a review or, uh, you know, hey, I've got some bonus scenes if you sign up for the mailing list here. And so I think that's why I don't end up plugging my website and stuff that often. But I feel like it's probably good to do at the end of a series, especially if your next thing isn't ready yet. Hey, you know, come follow me on Facebook or Twitter or here's my website. And as we've talked about on here before, you'll definitely get people who just won't sign up for mailing lists. I have people that are super regular about posting on my Facebook page and commenting on stuff. And I know they're not on my mailing list. They're just, <laughs> we are not mailing list people. We are Facebook people. Um, I've never run any campaigns trying to get more Facebook likes. I would probably recommend against doing that. Um, you seem to get in a situation where then you have like all these likes, like maybe you have 10,000 likes and then you post something and nobody's even liking it. And then it looks weird. It's like, okay, obviously this person just bought all these people. And, and more than that, it's, I think that Facebook, uh, you know, it's no secret that the more engagement a post gets, the more likely it's going to be shared. You know, I can see a direct correlation. Like I got lots of comments and, likes or you know emoticons whatever they are on this post and then it went to 10,000 people instead of the usual 2,000 so uh but the if you have all these people that have come to your page it may actually be a negative as far as uh, determining whether stuff is going to be shared or not so going on to specific more specific Facebook stuff Jeff it sounds like you do things with your personal account um I do not and I think I would go insane if I actually invited people to <laughs> friend me on Facebook. So I do everything on a page. Are you guys page people, groups, or a personal account? Um, I've actually got both. I tend to use more of my personal for that because to me, I, I get better response if they actually see me more as like a normal person than someone who has my own separate page signed up for it. So, but yeah, so I'll, I'll, I don't really put too much stuff about there. I'll just say like, hey, you know what? What, what movies have you seen lately or man alive i saw this this sucked rocks and you really get people tell me that uh because you don't appreciate you know whatever but but yeah I, I usually put that on my personal i uh i have a facebook fan page which like my regular page uh started off as just the book of deacon when i thought that's all i was going to do and i have sneakily and carefully sort of started to slide it toward being joseph r lalo the way i should have started um that is that's where i you know actually put book stuff and and talk about it it's been a little bit neglected in the past but it's starting to wake back up as i become more interested in, in doing that uh, i also do use groups but i use them mostly for like i have a beta readers group and such but so like organizing small groups of people i use groups uh, and just talking to the masses i use a fan page We've definitely had some authors on that are big fans of having like a, a group where they all read a book together each month or, and then the author really interacts with them a lot. I, my little introvert self, you know, the page is about the level I'm comfortable with. Only I can post content on it. And um, basically when people comment, which I do encourage, all I have to do is go like, 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 you know, or oh, heart. <laughs> uh, whereas with the group, I, cause I had one once for um, an ARC team and it surprisingly, turned into like kind of a drama fest where somebody would say like, Oh, I didn't like this about the book. And somebody else is like arguing about it in the comments and they would like be hurt feelings. And, and I had to see all this cause I was like the moderator and owner of the group. And I was like, I really don't want to see people's comments on whether what they didn't like about the book, you know, put that in the review. That's for that. So I ended that pretty quickly and I've been a little leery of uh, groups since then because the, potential for drama. I feel like with the page, I definitely get people that comment and then will interact. Like somebody will comment on somebody else's comment, but it's been free of drama, I would say. Very, very few hurt feelings and that kind of thing. So uh, I don't, like I said, I don't do the invite anybody to friend me. 
Um, I think it, I would just have, uh, is it still, do you guys know, is it a max of 2000 people you can be friends with? I think it is. I think I would have hit that if I invited fans and then it's just like your feed gets so ridiculous. I already feel just by like having friended a bunch of authors. Like every time I go to a conference and if I'm on a panel or something, people will friend me afterwards. And I try to, I'm like, Oh yeah, I met them at the conference. So I'm going to say yes, but you end up seeing all this stuff in your personal feed. That's like, what, I don't even remember who this person is. And then you don't see stuff from your high school friend that you wanted to see. So I try to kind of keep it personal over here. And then the page is my off professional thing. Yeah, and I believe, Go okay. ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I believe now as a page, you can join other groups. So you don't have to do it under your personal account if you don't want to. And it just depends on what you like, you know, as a, what you're comfortable with as an author. And if you only join Facebook because you're an author and you don't even have a personal thing, then sure, use that for fan interaction. I will say that, yeah, I, I, I will typically you know, go ahead and accept any friend that comes that pops up there. But if you start belittling, berating me with all kinds of stuff that shows up on my timeline, like, oh, if, I, if you are a true friend, you will copy and paste this status. I'm like, okay, you just got unfollowed. I won't unfriend you, but I will unfollow you. And I've done that to quite a few people there. So, or else if I get someone that says, oh, oh hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm collecting donations for this is here. So if all my friends could do this, I'm like, okay, you try and do something like that to get me to, Oh, like these chain mail, chain letters type of thing there. I was like, nope, it's just not going to happen. So that's the sort of thing that I, I have to keep control of. And I, I, will say, I will go through the settings and look for all those things that allow people to make comments like that. And I will turn them off. Which I all right. And as far as encouraging more engagement, you know, we talked about it earlier. If you put images into your posts, that seems to help. I haven't played a lot with video lately or yet, but I, I keep thinking I'm going to like, you know, like ask people for questions they want me to answer and then give, you know, it might just be recording on my iPhone, although I got a new Mac that I haven't really unboxed and played with yet uh, with the notion that I would actually edit some videos. So we'll see if I actually get around to that, but those are supposed to get pretty good engagement. If you do uh, videos or Facebook live things, just kind of spur the moment. But I'm, I'm doing pretty well in the last few months. I've uh, I'd kind of decided I'm going to try to post almost every day. And I'm going to do some of the things where you ask questions and, um, you know, relevant to your kind of building your brand. Like today, um, I just asked like, hey, what was your first uh, e-reader? Uh, mine was a Kindle back in 2010. And I shared, I was going to share like a stock photo of a Kindle. I'm like, well, that's stupid. So I, I took a picture of my puppy. <laughs> She's eight months old now. She's not really that much of a puppy with one of my books on the screen, you know, and I shared that. And that's more fun and going to get more comments and engagements. You know, somebody asked like, is your dog getting darker in color? <laughs> I'm like, ah, I, don't, I think it's just the lighting, but then just a generic picture. So if you have a, if it's a kind of question where you can just use a, take a quick photo, you know, I, I definitely recommend anything you can do to make your page not generic. Um, and Sometimes I'll post links to things that I find interesting, but uh, I have found that I get a lot less interaction with, um, like, I'll think something is cool. Like yesterday I posted a link to a, a woman that's like designing a new space suit for, for NASA for the upcoming Mars and moon stuff, you know, and I thought it was fascinating. And, you know, it got like a couple little, you know, likes or whatever, but, you know, I get a lot more engagement when I'm saying a news update something quirky that's happening in my life that I'm comfortable sharing. I'm kind of, you know, I don't share a whole lot of stuff, but like adventures with Willow, the, the dog I got last summer. You know, I feel like that's fair game. People love pets and I don't mind. It's nothing really private or personal that's going to, you know, be uncomfortable if I, if I share it. So I, what do you, what do you guys kind of share? Cause I, I've been like seeing what gets a lot of responses and, and what doesn't. So it's been kind of interesting. Um, I've done a variety of stuff. I, I say I, I like. I, I'm always. I've always been a big movie fan, so I'll, I'll ask them opinions about movies. What I what I like. What I don't like. Most of my fa my fans and readers usually agree with me. There's a few that don't. Um, there, there's a lot of times if I, you know, if, like if I'm getting ready to release a book or whatnot, I'll start you know getting them talking about the books. Hey, what's your favorite book? You know, in this series, you know. If by chance this happened to be turned into a movie, what would you, who would you think would be this character, that character? And that usually gets some pretty good discussions going that way. 
uh, the aforementioned fan art and commissioned art uh, I, I share a lot of. Uh, I also um, photos. I, I just just today, in fact, or yesterday, I uh, I was talking about how I have to taking notes longhand since I'm doing jury duty and I can't, you know, I have to steal any moment I can. And I took a picture of the Book of Deacon in its original form, which is 11 spiral bound notebooks. Uh, so photos like that. Also, when, with the Patreon, when I was prepping for the Patreon, every week I would put up a poll asking what people, what short story people would like me to write, to, uh, would like me to write that weekend. Uh, I found that polls get a surprisingly large amount of traction, but not a lot of discussion, which is actually what I prefer. So I've sort of cooled it on that. And I instead now ask the question that would have been in the poll and try to get comments in that way. It is interesting with those polls and surveys and things, how many people will actually respond to them. <laughs> because whenever I see that stuff, I'm like, delete, delete. You know, I'm not going to waste my time on this. But um, we have to remember, especially if you're sending people to your uh, social media pages after they finished your book, they're probably fans at this point, right? They, they wanted to seek you out. So it's not really, you're not cold selling. Uh, you, you're giving more of yourself to people who are genuinely interested in the brain that came up with, <laughs> you know, X series. So I, I feel like the point of having a Facebook page is to be a little bit a little bit of brand, a little bit yourself, and a little bit entertaining, or um, depending on what you write, maybe you want to like just give information. Um, but I, I, like I said, I, I just get a lot more engagement where it's just a little bit like here's a snippet of the story, or here's something that really, it's not, you know, it's all about dragons and spaceships and stuff. I, I almost everything is related to that, or maybe reading in general. And you might ask like, well, why? What's the point? You know, why? Why do you care what e-reader people have? And um, the point is that you get all this engagement on this one post and then the next day you're like, Hey dude, uh, Emperor's Edge books one through three, they're free right now. And uh, if you, I, I don't even ask for shares. I'm just like, Hey guys, these are free if you want to check it out. And I've done a few of those kind of posts uh, in the last six months or whatever, where I, I just post everything I have that's free at that particular month. And um, everybody, I get so much uh, action on those. I get like more than all the ones where I'm trying to, uh, you know, like, oh, let's post something that people will interact with. I'll get just a lot of people saying like, oh, I love those books. And they'll, they'll tag other people in the comments and share that even before, because the reason I post it is I'm going to do a boosted post is like what I want to do and target people that are fantasy fans that aren't already people who like my page. But if you then are going to do an advertisement like that, and there's all this social proof in the comments from people that love the series, you know, why wouldn't somebody that sees that go and, you know, grab the books? So those have been amazingly effective for me. I'll probably continue to do that every month or two, just, you know, whatever's free. Um, and I've, I mentioned at the beginning too, that, uh, when I have a new series or something and I post an affiliate link, Hey, book one's available, you know, after I've been talking it up for a little bit, that Facebook is my number two after my mailing list, as far as links that actually convert into sales. And I, I've been amazed. I've sold hundreds of books with just a Facebook boosted post uh, and just boosting it to my, um, regular people who have already liked my site. So it's, I feel like this is the one that's, if you're going to pick one social media thing, it's probably worth cultivating and working on this one. I don't spend a lot of time on it, even though I've made more of an effort to try to post something every day. You know, it's like, I would say not even five minutes. Uh, the exception might be if you do one that gets a whole lot of responses, like the, the e-reader one I did today. You know, you might have to like a bunch of things so that people know you're uh, paying attention to them. But I, I can just do that on my phone while I'm waiting in line at Whole Foods or whatever. So it's it's not too much of a time commitment. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on, um, I don't know if you use affiliate links or have you monitored it, done anything to see how effective Facebook is for you? It's one of those things where I really need to get into and mess around with. I just haven't got around to it yet. Uh, I've done a little bit of affiliate stuff and every now and then I'll, I'll watch the numbers when I boost a post. But as I said, Facebook sort of fell by the wayside along with most of my platform stuff uh, over the course of uh, a few months. And I'm just starting to wake it all back up now. So uh, haven't done a tremendous amount. All right. Well, we'll close up the Facebook stuff. I'll just say find ways to be entertaining i guess is because we're authors of fiction that's what people want from us and i have seen two people that will just they'll 
go out and find lots of those memes or even make them themselves, uh, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You can get a lot of uh, viral, whatever, engagement if, if you have something that's very funny, but most of those are not gonna be about your books and about you, so they're not really doing anything to, to sell your stuff. Whereas uh, yesterday I, I found a stock art of a dragon rollerblading or something and I posted, I was like, you guys, this is my dragon, Shulina Aria from my uh, Dragon Blood series. And if she ever gets a romance, I can, I can use this stock art again. So it's like sharing a fun photo, which should get some likes, but it's also about one of my books where a dragon goes on a scooter in human form. And why wouldn't you check it out after, you know, <laughs> seeing it on Facebook? It, so if it gets shared, you want something that if it does get shared, it actually relates back to you and might lead somebody to your books. All right, moving on to Twitter, which for all that I wish it was really good at selling books, you know, I, I get some action on like, I've got my profile link has got my uh, Star Nomad is free in there right now. And I've certainly, it's been a little bit more about making connections with people and uh, being there for the fans and making connections with other authors. I, I kind of enjoy that one. It's the one I was on before I started trying to sell books. So, and, and sometimes that's just how it is. You know, maybe if you pick Facebook as your uh, primary one to uh, kind of focus on since it has a huge audience and uh, there's potential there. Uh, then you pick Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, pick one other one that's your fun one. And for me, that's Twitter. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can actually, you know, be a little more effective, get more people to follow you. And if you do, I do usually get a few sales when I post a new uh, book on Twitter. And it's, uh, again, and sometimes somebody will be on Twitter and not on the other sites. And um, I don't know, I know Jeff's not a Twitter person, so <laughs> I don't think he's gonna chime in too much. But uh, Joe, you've been on there a long time too. What do you think as far as uh, building a fan base and selling books? Um, I, yeah, I don't use it to sell books very much. I obviously announce new releases and all that, but I almost never even expect any traction on Twitter. I find Twitter is very good at keeping track of other authors. Uh, I, get, I also was on it before I was, uh, I was publishing. And um, I mean, it's just like when it, we talk about building your brand, particularly if you're an avid user of Twitter, you are building your brand. Like people are just trends will occur within your, within your, within your posts. And I also, it's, I, I find a lot, uh, because a lot of other authors follow me and a lot of people who are fans of the show follow me. I find like am writing stuff is, is, uh, is really fun to share and, and tends to get a lot of feedback. It's just the, uh, I like it best for keeping in touch with fans because it's very immediate and it, you know, it, it encourages little short little snippets and conversation and you can use the like button as sort of a period at the end of a thread. So it's like, all right, we're all done talking. Good job, everybody. <laughs> It's just one of my favorites. I do like that, even though they've kind of boosted how much people can say, it's still kind of limited. So you're probably not going to get questions of like that require a long essay answer, which is often why my email goes unanswered. It's not that I'm ignoring somebody on purpose. It's just like, oh, that's going to require a long email. So I'll set it to the side. And then pretty soon it's three weeks later. I'm like, oh, I never did go back and answer that. Dang it. Um, so I like Twitter for that. Um, some of the mistakes I see people doing is uh, they're not really putting anything interesting out there. They're, all of these social media sites to be helpful to you as an author, you need to be kind of a content provider and not just part of the echo chamber. And I know we've talked about that before. I, I've actually gone to people, you know, author, they say something to me, so I'm going to check them out, you know, like, hey, are they writing in my genre or anything I want to see? And I go to their Twitter page and all it is is retweets of other people's stuff and I like I would have shared if they had said anything interesting like I would have reciprocated that they retweeted my link by you know sharing one of theirs or something but I just like well they haven't even said anything for the last six days it's just retweets of other people's stuff um, so I'm not saying not to retweet I do sometimes and it's nice that now you can add a comment too when you do so uh, but be careful I, I would just try to you know make your own Link, link to something. If you found something interesting, just make your own link, make your own tweet and link to it rather than just retweet, retweet, retweet. <laughs> um, do you do a lot of retweets or do you pay attention to people retweeting your stuff, Joe? I very rarely do any of my own retweets. When I do, I do the quote tweet feature where you can add to it. 
uh, when people tweet my stuff, I will usually quote tweet or at least reply because I'm very appreciative. Um, and but for the most part, yeah, I don't do a lot of sharing of other people's stuff. Not like not I'm not avoiding sharing other people's books, but I mean just in general, my usage of Twitter is much more conversational than than uh, um, I don't know informational. I'm the same way, and um, I definitely will tweet new releases or if I'm having a sale. Or um, now it's nice Twitter lets you pin a tweet to your profile page, and I, I always use the image feature for that for like a book cover, and like, hey, you can grab this for free right now, or I just released this new book one, check it out, and that's nice. I'll get a lot of people randomly liking that or retweeting it in the month or months that it's up there on the profile page. So I do know that people find me from Twitter and check out my stuff. And I've, I agree that it's, it's conversational. Like they can actually talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, whereas they may not get that feeling so much on your Facebook page if they're just responding to a post and they're one of a hundred people doing so. And so, and I, I will respond on Twitter. I, I don't know. I feel like obligated or it's just going to happen. If somebody sends me an at, you know, to my name, I will, I will generally, intend try to respond unless I accidentally you know forgot it scrolled off the screen before I commented or something and uh, I have had people kind of find me that way uh, it's another thing like Facebook I think it's best to share little tidbits it's a good place if you have a snippet that will fit if you can be kind of quirky and be you to the extent that you're willing to share in public I think it can be very powerful it, you know I've had people that don't read my genre and somehow stumbled onto me by a blog post that somebody shared or a, you know, a Facebook tweet or a Facebook post or a tweet. And it's amazing how people will check you out, even though like they don't read fantasy or science fiction, but they're like, well, you know, they were kind of an interesting person. So I'll check out the book. So I guess that's the tip is be interesting. <laughs> Jeff agrees. <laughs> Jeff of the Twitter fan club. <laughs> no comprendo. <laughs> Um, we should say, make sure if you are on Twitter, and, and this is another one where even though you, if you look at my page, you'll think, oh, she's on there every day. She's spending a lot of time on there. It's more that I have a, a group of friends that I direct message and have that open all the time. So I end up randomly, I'm like, oh, I should post a link or something, you know. So I'll, I'll tweet every day, but I don't spend a whole lot of time. You know, I might only have four or five tweets in my feed for that day. Um, and the rest of the stuff is just a way to keep, in, keep track with friends. But it's it's also not a huge time commitment. I uh, a lot of stuff you just out walking the dogs or something and think of it and like oh I'm gonna it's on my phone app so I'll tweet it and share and you never know when a picture of your dog carrying a stick will get shared around and you know it's it's interesting. I do get a lot more shares and likes and interaction on Facebook, but you can get some on Twitter and I am not successful at all at going like hugely viral on uh, Twitter. <laughs> I don't know if you ever have Joe, but I just don't seem to have that gift of a. Uh, tapping into the zeitgeist and <laughs> saying something witty that gets thousands of shares around i have had two things that were very like came close to being viral one of them was not at all related to my books i had spotted a person wearing a costume from a late night talk show and i tweeted it to the host of that talk show and he shared it and i got 500 retweets and, and likes and stuff like that uh, similarly, I made a, I made a, a, a like a memeish uh, movie poster for the movie Skyscraper, in which I claimed that the main character was being shot out of a man cannon, and that got a lot of likes and shares, and was worthless for anything except getting people to to be aware that I exist. But uh, I actually had a very long thread conversation with with people, and I feel like it got me out there. Uh, at least made people more aware of the things I'm passionate about. When I asked if anybody in the UK had eaten biscuits as I know them, like the buttermilk biscuits that you get at Popeye's uh, or KFC, uh, and we got into a gigantic conversation about baked goods across the uh, the Atlantic Ocean, and it was fantastic. <laughs> so I feel like you're going to demonstrate, you're demonstrating what my next point was going to be, that you don't have to be super entertaining and be the kind of person that gets retweeted everywhere because that's the random stuff that gets tweeted. <laughs> They're probably not going to sell books, but being there and kind of being a bit of a, you're, you know, yourself. Uh, I wouldn't say you have to be like this huge internet personality or anything like that. I mean, we're all very introverted <laughs> here on this show. And these, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, to the extent that you're comfortable with sharing. And like, I know I they pretty much never put anything super personal on uh, 
Facebook or Twitter, but I am totally comfortable sharing things about my characters. They are this outside creation that I've made and then people will already know about them, some of them. So it seems more natural and I, I can do that. And that's what people want anyway, if they're looking for entertainment. Um, I, I guess one of the last things is just to say, make sure and fill out your profile because you get an opportunity to do that on Twitter. It's a pretty limited little space. So, you know, just you can say something about you, but you can put a link in it. And I will, I've used the books to read link so I can actually see how many people click it. And I, I recently went in and looked at my one that I've had up for a few months on Twitter, which as I said was Star Nomad, which is free, the first book in my Fallen Empire series. And it had about 650 clicks, you know, and it, it told, then Books to Read told me like 550 of those went to Amazon, 22 went to Kobo, you know. So if you use a, a tracking link like that, you can actually get the information. And, and Twitter also has some analytics of its own if you're curious, like what was my you know, most popular post, uh, what, what topics do my followers have in common? And uh, so there, there is a little bit in there if you go poke around. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on should you follow everyone? I know when I first joined, uh, I followed everyone that would follow me back because <laughs> I was just there to look for agents. I wasn't really like trying to become a internet presence or anything like that. I didn't have any books for sale yet. And I've kind of had to back off of that, gradually trying to unfollow anybody who's annoying <laughs> or who I never talk to. And now I just kind of follow people if they engage me in conversation a couple of times. I feel like it's polite, like I'll follow them back. Um, but I tend not to just follow people that follow and never say anything. I, uh, I don't follow back. Like if you want a lot of followers, follow back because that's a thing that happens. <laughs> like, you, you, like lots of people, the number of people who follow them and the number of people they follow are very close for that exact reason. Uh, I only follow 202 people apparently. I just, I just opened up the thing. Uh, I typically only follow people that I want to see updates from. I'm perfectly happy having conversations with people, uh, but I don't always follow them back because, I mean, my feed is already, with only 202 people, my feed is already sometimes unmanageable for, from my point of view. So if I followed everybody that I have conversations with, it would get out of hand. Although I do tend to follow people that I have conversations that need to be in any way private so that I can direct message them. Uh, so there are a lot of people I follow for that purpose. But generally speaking, uh, uh, I will answer anybody who tweets at me, but I will only really follow people who I sort of want up-to-date information on. It's kind of interesting, and I guess we just each have to decide on our own how you want to do it, because I just don't bother with the main feed. I mean, I follow like 1,500 people, so I couldn't even if I wanted to, but I just only have the, the people who at me <laughs> to uh, direct message at me. That's that's the feed that's up on my app and stuff if I, uh, if I look at stuff. Usually, if I look in the main feed, I get irritated, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like, oh, look, po factory. politics and rants. <laughs> so I just self-filter, filtered out that way. But, you know, and that's, it's up to you as an author to, to decide. Do you want to keep a small little list that uh, you can actually enjoy following your feed? Because I don't necessarily see if Joe posts something unless I happen to, for some reason, he added me or somebody mentioned him, you know, then I go look, oh, what's Joe been tweeting? Because I miss it by not following the main feed um but it's just up to you you know i i like to not be aloof i mean i like to like yeah if you talk to me i'll talk back and um i'll follow you it just seems polite but um yeah you can end up following you know you actually probably not gonna end up following too many crazy people that way if you only uh follow the people who follow you and talk to you um but if you're as far as is there any point in just following a ton of people just to grow the size of your follower list probably not it's not going to impress anybody if you follow 50,000 people and 50,000 people follow you back it's just okay well this person did reciprocal probably knows doesn't really have any fans you know i think it's actually probably what joe's doing the fewer you follow but the more followers you have is going to look better if you care about that like if you were trying to get an agent that might be the kind of time that you want your platform to look like, oh, you're really entertaining and have a lot of loyal followers, but I don't worry too much about it. A lot of the people I have unfollowed is just because they're inactive accounts, and I'm not sure how long those actually show up in your followers or not, so I don't know. Um, last little tip for Twitter, and I guess for Facebook too, and I have to remind myself of this all the time, is do not use it as a place to rant or to like, 
what is it called? Twitter shaming, <laughs> you know, to try to get stuff. That's fine if it's your personal thing and nobody's following you. But the minute you become an author, you have to consider yourself, this is your business professional image that you're trying to maintain. And I often, if I catch myself ranting, I'll later go back and delete it because I'm like, that was stupid. And nobody likes that. Nobody shares that kind of stuff. You just look like a dumbass. So <laughs> try, it's, it's easy, especially on Twitter because you can put it out there so quickly. And that's where I, I've occasionally ranted about MS Word and crashing and things like that. And like I said, I usually go back and delete it. I think more wisely of it, but you never know who is watching your feed. You know, I mean, I definitely know, I know for a fact I've had agents and publishers say, yeah, well, we totally go check out authors before we sign them. So if you're self-publishing, you cannot care that as much about that, but you still have readers or potential readers that may not want to check you out if you seem to be an angry bitter person that's always ranting so yeah I, like i don't i don't try to be actively positive like i don't go to say daily affirmation type stuff but i try not to be terribly negative and i don't know if it's some magic threshold or if the twitter bots have gotten particularly good but if i say anything even passingly negative or just sort of observing about a product or service I will usually hear back from their Twitter handle talking to me about it. So it makes me feel very watched. So I tend to like, well, it's, it, it makes me, it makes me behave as though I would behave if they were literally in the room with me, you know, and maybe that's better. Maybe that's the way we should all behave sometimes. It is funny when you'll get tweets from their, whoever customer service is. I had the Bernstein Bears tweet back to me when I mentioned that uh, I enjoyed their books as a kid or something, or whoever's the publisher that handles the Twitter feed. I'm like, oh, I can't even talk about the Bernstein Bears without getting comments from the publisher. Okay, I'm being watched. I had, uh, I had, I actually ended up getting a conversation going between Iowa and Wisconsin's dairy councils about whose cheese was better. So somehow Maytag blue cheese and Wisconsin cheese just sort of converged on my feet. It was very strange. It is almost bizarre how many professional people and organizations have a presence on Twitter and actually are out there from presidents to uh, you know people you wouldn't think that would just be have time to tweet or you know people working on behalf of these organizations or people you know so it, or if people nothing that else shouldn't tweet at all <laughs> well i mean it's it's interesting like all the senators and things are on there and rant they rant <laughs> that's their job i guess if you're politics you know and i've even seen authors who uh are very ranty, but that's kind of the persona they've chosen. They're very antagonistic and they you can become popular that way. So if that suits your personality, go for it. I mean, there's certainly some authors out there that uh, you probably can think of that like <laughs> just rant and uh, ranty blog posts and tweets and such, but um, that has to be your personality. I feel like those of us who are kind of more introverted probably won't go for that kind of thing, but um, I guess that's about all I've got to say on Twitter and Facebook and we talked forever. I, I, I told the guys this was going to be a short show. <laughs> they know better. Than and, and, and what did I say in response? <laughs> Don't jinx us. <laughs> You're going to jinx us. <laughs> I'm going to jinx us. All right. Well, so why don't we just close off? Do we, do you guys have anything uh, that you want to pimp or that people could check out right now? Uh, the only thing I was going to say is, like, uh, stay tuned. I'm going to be attempting a new genre for me, which is dark fantasy. So, or putting a full length novel in dark fantasy. So, fingers crossed. Hope it's good. Uh, as for me, uh, my next Big Sigma Five, which is called Indra Station, is currently on pre order and will be releasing uh, a week from tomorrow. So, pick that up if you're interested in my sci fi stuff. And I guess check out my Patreon, which continues to release at least one new short story or novella every uh, month. Uh, the next one is coming out on the 27th. So I'm going to have two releases in three days. And that's just J.R. Lalo. So that's what I got. All right. Excellent. And a, a big thank you for everyone who has listened all the way to the end of this episode. If you want to grab something from me, my uh, Emperor's Edge box set, first three books are free right now. And I got a book bub coming up on my Fallen Empire bundle, which will also be free soon. So if you've ever wanted to read three books at once by me for free, now is your chance. All right. Thank you for listening, everyone, and have a good week. All right. Take it easy. Bye-bye, everybody.